Hi. So topic five, second part. Hope I managed to get this done before somebody comes knocking at the door and I have to stop recording. So we're going to, it's a shorter than the first video, it should be anyway. Um, central bank digital currencies, CBDCs and stable coins. Okay, that's what we're going to do. And central bank digital currencies, what are they? Well, it's a new form of central bank money, like cash or the savings accounts or um, deposits, uh, all sorts of different money supply measures like M1, M2, M3. If you're doing economics, you'll, you'll know all about those. So it's a central bank liability, but it's different from the traditional reserves. Um, it also serves as a medium of exchange like cash. So it's more like M1 than anything else but it can be different as, as well as we shall see um, in terms of things like interest rates and certainly in terms of the way it's transferred and um, the way it's produced. There's some good sources of information here on the Institute of Actuaries reports, probably one of the most complete ones. Um, and uh, then there's a nice coin telegraph article here. So let me show you those on my screen. There's the Institute of Actuaries report here from March last year. Um, so it goes through the context of the digital currencies, um, financial inclusion, so, you know, so everybody has access to them, the type of technology that are used. It's all private blockchains actually. Um, anyway, so that's a good report, I think. And also this is the, um, a little video by uh, Coin Telegraph made two months ago about CBDCs because they really are central the central bank digital currencies and their role in the financial system. Central bank digital currencies are a digital representation of a country's fiat currency. They are effectively a government issued cryptocurrency designed to replace the traditional physical form of fiat currencies. The term CBDC is broad because its implementation involves several critical decisions on the part of an issuing central bank. The primary decision is whether a CBDC should be a general purpose and that it's available to be used by the general population. Okay. So I'm not going to play that. It's seven minutes long, but those are two good sources of general information about CBDCs. Um, back to this. Why do we want CBDCs? What's the motivation? Well, Certainly in countries like Africa or so where banks are not trusted and people are already using things like M-Pesa, it makes obvious sense to have a proper digital currency instead of mobile phone minutes, which is what is currency, currently used with um, as the currency in parts of Africa. Um, and it's a resilient payments landscape because being on a blockchain, it can be fast, it's uh, transparent and so forth. Um, it avoids the risks of new forms of private money creation like Bitcoin or stable coins um, that I'm gonna be talking about later in this lecture. Supporting competition efficiency and innovation in payments. So it allows um, uh, people to have access to funds that wouldn't otherwise have that um, and, uh, and thereby compete with uh, larger companies. Um, meeting future payment needs in a digital economy. Well, when everything becomes digital, everybody's just using um, WeChat for everything or whatever, then it makes sense to have a digital yuan to go with WeChat. And if you're not, if you, the central bank doesn't provide one, then WeChat would provide it in the same way that Facebook tried to provide its own currency, Libra. But that was last year's news. And unfortunately, it didn't succeed. Um, anyway, that's, uh, as I said, last year's news. We can talk more about that perhaps in a seminar or in a, um, a drop-in. So, Avoid, uh, improving the availability and usability of central bank money. A lot of central bank money like M3 is tied up and it takes days to get access to it 
For example, it may be in some savings account that takes a long time to withdraw, um, but uh, digital currency, as well as maybe ordinary hard cash, um, uh, improves the accessibility of central bank money um, and maybe substitutes for cash as well, because we are in a world where there is a decline in use of actual cash. Um, and one of them, this is what is last, this is from the Bank of England, but this is almost certainly the main motivation, as a building block for better cross-border payments. And Ripple has moved into that area, and I think that central banks would rather have their own digital currency rather than using Ripple for, to replace this swift monopoly that um, the US is using to hold governments to ransom in many ways. So CBDCs potentially have a much greater functionality for retail transactions than cash. In particular, if I wanted to buy something from um, another country, then I can use my credit card, but it goes through um, uh, an exchange rate that I have to pay for, and uh, it can be a lot more costly to buy things in other currency, in other countries, in other currencies, than if there was a central bank currency that was acceptable in other countries. Um, it has a separate operational structure to other forms of central bank money. Um, they can serve a different purpose. They can have different interest rates from the standard reserves. So it could be that CBDCs are only used for certain transactions um, and cash is used for other. For example, you may not be able to use your CBDC if you go and buy a cup of coffee, but you can use cash or your credit card. Some countries, for example, China, are actually thinking of getting rid of traditional cash altogether and replacing it completely with a digital yuan. Um, and maybe the motivation for that is that CBDCs are much easier to track and there's a lot of um, news about the money laundering that can be done with traditional cash, just taking it out in a suitcase you know, or um, hiding it in a statue when you ship it overseas, uh, while well, you couldn't do that with digital um, forms of cash. So Bahamas have just this week or last week issued the very first CBDCs. Um, it's called the sand dollar. So it's available only to residents though. They, it's not available to me, for example. Um, and the transfers are made just with a mobile phone, not with anything else, it's just an app on a phone. So it can be used at any merchant with um, a central bank, bank approved e-wallet on a mobile device. So when you design a CBDC, there has to be at the heart of it, a DLT, a private blockchain, a core ledger, a fast, secure, resilient platform for the functionality of the payments. And then it needs, it says API access. Well, it could have a smart contract access if the private blockchain had a second layer that allowed smart contracts on it. But I mean, the Bahamas doesn't have that. I'm not sure what's happening with the Chinese one, but at least an API would need um, to link the ledger with the interfaces the Bahamas just has mobile phone, but you could have cards, credit cards for digital bank currencies, or you might use your computer and have accounts like that. So China and Sweden um, are, have been uh, launching their currencies for quite some time. Um, a few days ago, uh, China's central bank um, made some changes to the law. And um, so if you have a look at this, again, it's always Cointelegraph. There is actually a video that if you want to listen to the article, you can. Um, so the People's Bank of China published a draft law that aims to provide the right regulatory framework for the digital yuan. And um, Sweden began testing their e-krona earlier this year. And um, 
until February next year, then they plan to launch the e-corona properly. In fact, when I gave this lecture last year, there were very few central banks that were saying digital currencies. No, we're very, very skeptical about this. Now, 85% of central banks are in the process of issuing digital currencies. So CBDCs is really the flavor of 2020. Um, so they, this is an article from a couple of days ago about central bank digital currencies will change our conceptions of money and its uses completely. Um, from that article, I've just taken this graph here. This shows the timing of speeches by CBDCs, I mean, by central banks on the topic of CBDC. So for example, in um, 2019, only 20 or 30 central banks gave a speech at any particular month about that mentioned CBDCs, but it's definitely been rising since last summer. So last month, more than 40 central banks were talking about CBDCs in their speeches. And looking at Google searches um, in 2017, Bitcoin, when it was having its first uh, major bubble, there have been several before then, it was the third major bubble, but this one where it nearly reached $20,000. Bitcoin was the search term. And then last year, as I said, the Libra coin and the Calibra wallet and all the grand ideas that Facebook had for their own digital currency, um, Libra was, was the most important thing. And now at the moment, at the time of this lecture, it is the CBDCs, that's what everybody's talking about. So I'm gonna go on now um, to finish this lecture and uh, stable coins and in particular Tether is what I'm gonna talk about now. So these coins are almost always just a digitization of some financial asset where the price is pegged to some basket or single asset. It could be the dollar. There's lots of stable coins linked to the dollar or Euro or a basket of fiat currencies, or it could be linked to other cryptocurrencies or a basket of them or it could be linked to some commodities, exchange traded commodities. So most stable coins are backed. In other words, uh, you can um, redeem your coin and get the asset back. So you should be able, if you hold Tether, you should be able to swap one Tether for $1. Um, or this is a, um, one of the early commodity-backed tokens, gold, digits gold. One DGX is one gram of gold. That's very interesting. I wouldn't mind buying some of that in the moment. I think gold's going to be um, very important as the US election sends the global stock markets tumbling, which I suspect it will for a while until the next incumbent of the White House realizes that the only way to stop the US economy from completely collapsing is to carry on pumping billions of dollars into the banks to buy US stocks. Oops, I'm off topic again, sorry. Right, back to digital gold. Um, so hit on this website, it gives you the exchange rate for Ether and you can buy DGX with crypto. This is something I definitely think I need to do. Anyway, back to the lecture. So let's go minimize that and talk about what stable coins are aiming to do. Um, so they, the fees of transactions are very low and the transactions are secure and somewhat or completely anonymous in a stable coin. So that's, very um, attractive to many people. Um, they can be used for very high frequency transactions on these crypto exchanges, which move incredibly rapidly. That improves liquidity. 
Uh, it provides global access to some stable currency. Anybody can buy Tether, um, which is, uh, as I said, the uh, first stable coin um, to be tied to the dollar. Um, and Hakanoon's seven part guide argues for stable coins as a much better and uh, more stable financial system. Um, so seven parts. <laughs> This was written last year because stable coins were very, very much. You know, two, 2018 was the year of the initial coin offering. 2019 was stable coin and Libra and 2020 is uh, CBDCs. But as you can see, this is part chapter one, okay? So part one of seven. And that's the Winklevoss um, twins, more about them when we talk about exchange traded funds and other um, derivative type products on, um, uh, on crypto towards the end of this module. Anyway, so if you wanna find out anything you wanna know about stable coins, this article by Hacker Noon is very, very complete. Fiat-backed stable coins were the first and most popular type. We, we call them stable coins, but actually they're almost all tokens. So with fiat pack and backed, there's an issuing company which manages deposits of fiat, which is, can't be on a blockchain, of course, um, and issues a new stable coin. So it's all managed off chain with some custodian bank, which is difficult to audit. We'll talk about this issuing company for Tether at the end of this lecture. So there's loads of fiat-backed stable coins now. Uh, USDT, that's Tether. True USD, also pegged to $1. PAX, supposedly pegged to $1. But I mean, PAX has got a, a market cap of a quarter of a billion, whereas Tether now has a market cap of more than $16 billion. That's a huge amount, $16 billion. It's about 20% of world GDP. <laughs> and that's just been printed as a stable coin on the blockchain. <laughs> and EURS, that's a one euro is a one EURS. So these coins once minted, I shouldn't say printed, I should say minted, can be traded on exchanges and they should be redeemable from the issuer. But if everybody went back to the tether company and said, I want to change my tether for one dollar, I bet they haven't got 16 billion in reserves. This collateral is crucial for the price stability and it should equate to the circulating supply. And then there's crypto backed ones where instead of an issuing company, you just got a smart contract. So it's a lot more um, transparent. Uh, so you, you put your crypto into the stable coin using a smart contract on the Ethereum or EOS blockchain. And that's how you get your stable coin. Um, the collateral is typically a cryptocurrency portfolio. It can be Ether, it can be Bitcoin, it doesn't really matter. Um, and it's managed on chain. So there's no, and if it's a public chain like Ethereum or EOS, there's no need for a third party trust. And a great example of this is the DAI token. Let me show you a bit about that, the DAI token. Make a die. Let's play the video a little bit. We use technology to make better tools, products, services, you name it. But what if we use it to make money universal and open to use for anyone, anytime? Anywhere. Meet Dai. Better, smarter money. Dai is just cash. 
you can spend it, transfer it, or save it. But unlike traditional currencies, it's unbiased. No single institution controls its value. And unlike its fellow digital currencies, it's stable. Don't experience the volatility of other cryptocurrencies. With DAI, you get the best of both worlds. Anyone can generate DAI when they put up assets to back it. And you can also earn the DAI savings rate. The future of a better, smarter money is now. Start using DAI today and get financial freedom. Okay, so um, it's... Remember most of the dApps that um, I talked about when we were looking at the end of the Ethereum lecture and other public blockchains lecture, topic four. Um, and a lot of the dApps were make a die funded. Um, actually, if you go down here, I think you'll probably see, yeah, over 400 apps and services have integrated DAI particularly on the DeFi platform. Remember the DeFi platforms are um, a way of like peer-to-peer -peer lending. Um, and so if you buy DAI and DAI is used for peer-to-peer -peer lending with maybe some very credit risky individuals because um, they can't get loans from standard sources, they have to pay very high interest. So if you, um, if you buy DAI, you can get, and, and you, um, choose to put your die in one of the DeFi platforms, you can get that high rate of interest that they were just talking about. Okay, maybe not at the moment where credit risk is pretty high, but later when we've recovered from COVID and credit risk decreases, die would be a good idea to get and then put it in some of these peer-to-peer -peer platforms, the DeFi platforms. So the thing about crypto back tokens like DAI um, is that there are more sources of risk, more operational risk, could just be bugs in the smart contract code, but also the use of the tokens in the case of DAI, there's quite an operational risk there to get your credit risk as well. But there's no third party regulations, the whole company could get hacked, could go bust. And because the values of the collateral that they use is crypto, which is quite volatile compared with the dollar. Um, there is more price instability. And we'll have a look later at the price of DAI, where, how much it fluctuates from $1. It doesn't stay exactly $1. So um, because there's more price instability, um, you do need to keep more collateral in order to um, ensure the um, no, stability of the company as well as the token. All right, now let's get on to Tether. So Tether, there's the token there, is supposed to be linked to the dollar. But as you can see around March this year, when all the markets crashed, including Bitcoin, um, during the beginning of the COVID pandemic, um, the Tether price was very unstable. And it's never exactly one, it hovers around one, okay? So um, the reasons that it, it is never exactly um, uh, pegged to one USD is that it's traded hugely. It's traded all over the into the um, uh, the blockchains, the um, the uh, um, the web. Oops, what am I doing now? I don't want to do that. I want to go to do, 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 do. yeah. And here's Tether, right? What's it doing right now? You can see the market cap is 16 and a half billion. What's it been doing today? Can't see that, let me just make it bigger. So this is coin market cap, right? So it was trading at 0 0.999 and then it, now it's gone up there. The market cap, that's, this line here, okay, so suddenly falling a lot. Um, sometimes they withdraw tether 
um, and put it back in the holding company. And the green line is the um, price. Um, and this blue line, sorry, the blue line market cap, green is price. And the, sorry, this is the price of Bitcoin, this yellow one. And this is the price of Tether and the market cap of Tether. Oh, so no, market cap jumped up. They just issued a whole lot more. They're issuing Tether the whole time. Um, let's have a look here for um, Crypto Compare. You can see the live trading on Tether. These are the exchanges where it's traded, the main exchanges, it's, changed, it, it's traded everywhere. But if we look here, most of it is on crack and that's got the monopoly and Bitfinex. Um, and uh, by currency, mainly dollar. Um, this is um, another stable coin, the Euro, Euro as well. Um, FTX is another large. These are all major exchanges here. Right, so give you an overview of what's happening with Tether. This is a volume that's being traded. Um, and in terms of the general coin list, there was a time when it was right up here in terms of if we just look at, if we do total volume and it should do it by that, or if we order by market cap, can I? Oh, that's the wrong way up. Okay, so its market cap is, says 10 point, uh, so it's different here. I, I mean, who knows? You can see the price going up and down like this. Um, I would trust Crypto Compare as opposed to Coin Market Cap. Crypto Compare is a much more reliable website. Oh, by the way, I was going to show you, where is it? There was the Crypto Compare re report I wanted to show you. Oh, well, I can show it to you here. Hang on. In the... Um, Research guides. Um, exchanges. No, no, wait a minute. Is that data? Research. Yeah, these reports are very, very good on Crypto Compare. You can get historical data. Um, they, they, um, it's a paid for service now. Watch the real time. Very soon, Arben and I will have our names all over this page um, for the first volatility index based on um, the options that are traded on Bitcoin. So I'll let you know when that happens. We're doing the final touches at the moment. Anyway, back to the lecture. Um, So the Bitfinex Exchange senior team, the chief executive officer, chief financial officer, chief security, chief um, uh, security officer, I suppose, chief technology officer, chief compliance officer, general counsel, and whoever, community manager. This is the senior team, the board of Bitfinex, right? And this is the board of Tether, and you can see, the names basically coincide. And in 2018, there was a big crash in Bitcoin in January because the price had risen at the end of 2017 to $20,000. Um, and it crashed down to about 10 after that. And it coincided with Tether and Bitfinex being subpoenaed by the CFTC. I think I've got that link up so let me show you if not i'll just where are we yes this one here so this was back in january hang on let's uh patients are, are we going hang on. take it to the beginning so of sick patients are, are we going oh no much quicker wait a minute it's, it's been fast. running since i put it up yeah so oh, wait a the minute. treatment just... that was paused um and then just really? ended from eli lily is that so this is back in 2018. 
Well, uh, what the, the backstory here is that Tether is supposed to uh, be pegged to the U.S. dollar. So for every Tether that's created, and, and Tether is a virtual currency, for every Tether that is created, they're supposed to have received one dollar, and they're supposed to hold that dollar in a bank account. Um, that means that Tether would sort of be a stable coin and not really uh, veer in price away from one dollar, unlike Bitcoin, which can go to twenty thousand dollars and back down to twelve thousand dollars in the span of a week. The, the concern has been for many months now that, that neither Tether, uh, the, the company Tether won't confirm to people that they actually hold this money in reserve. That's, I mean... It... Okay, so they were supposed to be audited about three or four times and they never did. And I mean, it's still going on. There's still a problem. Um, so uh, one of the reasons well this is like a sort of cancer in the whole crypto asset space so this was a very interesting paper is bitcoin really untethered it was published in the journal of finance um, by these guys griffin and shams and they did similar things with the vix and the trading of options on the s p 500 so um this is the tether company this is the Bitfinex exchange and other exchanges, Poloniex, Huobi, Binance, it's one of the biggest ones, Bittrex. And this is like a network map, a, a bit like the whale alert map that I showed you before of um, the main flows. So this is to, and this is from in this way. Okay, so bit from Tether to Bitfinex. And then the size of the node is how much is held there, how much tether is there. And then it goes from Bitfinex to Poloniex, from Poloniex to Bittrex, back to Bitfinex. Um, how does it get to others? It goes from Bittrex. Bittrex mainly are sending it to other exchanges, which are then sending it to Binance, Huobi, OKEx. So this is a map that they drew showing the flows of Tether and, and, and implicating Bitfinex during this legal case. Still, as I said, still going on. And then there's a paper that I wrote with Michael, as I've mentioned, Michael Dacos, who was teaching this module um, last year, my eldest PhD student. Um, we published this paper that actually um, became quite, um, there's a lot of interest from the Financial Times and, um, uh, and other media, where we showed that the, um, the spreads between Bitfinex and other exchanges um, became very dislocated at a time um, when the tether supply was, um, was, was uh, decreased. As soon as it decreased the tether supply, so they take tether back into the company and then they issue it again, as I mentioned. Um, and during this time here, until they started issuing Tether again, and then they stopped and then the, the spread went up again. And then the price of Bitcoin mirrors exactly this Tether supply. Now, don't forget this is after the whole business in January, 2018. So it's still going on. And so we wrote um, an article about this in our Medium blog, um, which I'll show you in a minute. Um, once I've, uh, well, no, I'll, I'll do that now. Um, so a few things on, uh, on the internet. So um, yeah, there's the article, welcome to Bitfinex second tether bu bubble. Um, and uh, then um, there's also, as I said, in various other media, if you want to search for it. And um, if we look at the live map, um, that's, why is it not working? Let me re reload the page. It doesn't, doesn't show for very long. So here we are. This is what's happening at the moment. Binance, Crack and Huobi. It'll take a while for us to see the, the flows. But Bitfinex is, um, is not there because uh, uh, Bitmex and Bitfinex have been the subject of um, a lot of regulation. It's taking a long time to load. Hang on, let me go to another one. This is the Binance hack, okay? So here we should be able to, we can see Binance, Bitstamp. So 
hackers managed to steal around this is the hacking node right so we're going to see a lot of um bitcoin going into the binance so it would be really oh there we are so this is the hack with um yeah <laughs> whatever so this type of um of network map was used to show that the tether flows sorry that's just the felix thing it's a new european exchange features a lot on well alert but to show that the the, the tether flows have um were actually um uh by this uh, corrupt and fraudulent board of bitfinex so to conclude this lecture there are problems with stable coins. Um, they're centralized, um, so requires the trust of an entity. External audits to ensure the asset back bar basket is collateralized. Not enough regulation, could have as much as you want. Tether's reached 16 billion. Lack of transparency, difficult to trace the flows, and um, the asset class has been growing too rapidly. Look, I've got my delivery, so I've stopped share and stopped the recording. Bye for now. <laughs> Stop recording.